So you've got yourself some money. If you speak to a financial advisor about what you should do with it, they'll normally make a recommendation that involves some kind of a split between stocks and bonds. For example, a typical balanced allocation is often considered to be 40% in stocks and 60% in bonds. Or there's the 100 minus your age rule, which says that you should deduct your age from 100, put that amount in stocks and the rest in bonds. So this is how we're being told to invest and we're being told to invest like this, presumably because it works, then when we look at what really wealthy people do, we should see that they're investing this way too, right? Wrong. We've looked into how the super rich actually invest and the results might surprise you. In the US, there's an organization called Tiger 21. And to be considered as a member, you need to have investable assets of at least $20 million. Every quarter, they survey their members to find out how they divide their investments between different types of asset. And this gives us a really useful window into what the seriously wealthy are doing. Let's go through a breakdown of how they invest and then share some of the lessons that you can learn from it, even if you're not quite ready to be filling in your membership form just yet. To start with, they have 13% of their total assets in cash. And when you consider that that's 13% of at least $20 million, that's a whole lot of cash sitting around. Then they have 7% in what they call here fixed income, which means bonds. Now that's 7%, but remember, one of the recommendations we saw earlier was to have 60% of your investments in bonds. They then have 25% in public equities, which just means the stock market. Then you can add in another 6%, which is just a few smaller, more niche kinds of allocation. So if you add all that up, that takes you to just more than half of their total assets. That's half which is allocated to the type of thing that you and I are told to invest in. So where's the rest? Well, 22% is in private equity, which means investments in businesses that aren't listed on the stock market. Now, in the context of this survey, that can mean businesses that they own and lead, or it can mean private businesses that they have smaller stakes in purely as an investor. That leaves 27% left over, which is allocated to real estate or property. We got there in the end. And that can be in funds or directly owned, and it can be commercial or residential. So what can we take away from this? Well, for me, the fact that they've got half of their investments split pretty much equally between investments in businesses and investments in property perfectly illustrates something that we've been talking about on this channel for years, which is when it comes to growing wealth, there is nothing better than owning a business. And when it comes to preserving your wealth, there's nothing better than property. You could also see this illustrated if you look at the Sunday Times Rich List, where there are quite a lot of people who have property listed as their source of wealth. But in almost every case, these are situations where the property has been in their family for generations and the current holder has just inherited it. There are very few cases where someone has made it onto the rich list in their own lifetime with property as the primary driver of that wealth. Again, most of them have made their money in business and are storing some of that wealth in property. This explains the 50% allocation between the two that we saw in the survey, because people who've got a net worth of at least 20 million are still interested in making more money because hey, why not? but they're also concerned with preserving that wealth for future generations to benefit from. If you look at the performance of property over hundreds of years, you can see that it's got a track record of just narrowly outpacing inflation over the very long term. So just buying property with cash and holding it isn't in itself gonna make you fabulously wealthy. Using leverage can do, and we'll come back to that. But property as a tool for preserving the real value of that wealth over decades and centuries to come is pretty unbeatable. And it's also simple enough that if you do pass it on to future generations, it's hard for them to mess it up. So does this mean that you should invest in the same way as the super rich? Well, not necessarily. For a start, they can afford to take on more risk. They can make slightly racier investments. And if they don't work out, then, well, they're probably not gonna end up on the street. You also need to remember that their investments in private businesses are likely to involve work on their part, as well as skill and specialist knowledge that they've built up over time. You can't just make this type of investment if you don't have experience in business and the time to dedicate to it. The typical financial advice that you see is typical for a reason. It works most of the time for most people. It's not gonna get you spectacular results that change your life, but it's also highly unlikely to go horribly wrong. But this is why it's really important to understand your goals. 
If you do want one day to join the type of club that requires eight figures to your name, if you can stomach taking some risks, and if you are willing to put in hard work and develop some skills, then you can learn a lot from how the super rich invest. So I'm curious, how do you currently split your investments between different types of asset? I'd love to know, so let me know in the comments. And remember earlier when I mentioned using leverage to turn property from a wealth preserver into a wealth supercharger? Well, watch this video next where we explain exactly how to harness leverage and inflation so property can make you rich in the long term.